Welcome to the Café Culture podcast, a season of discussions on culture, politics, philosophy and science. At a talk recorded on the 18th of July, 2016, Owen Jones discussed the politics of hope. Um, well, well, thank you very much. Thank you for introducing me in, in such a kind of way. It's great to be here. So little to talk about. We live in such an uneventful period, don't we? I am lost for words. Uh, no, it is, a, it is a pleasure to be here. And I know some of you, the politics of hope as a title now always sounds like a joke. Uh, but it is at times of challenge. We'll stick with challenge. Uh, that I think uh, this subject is now more topical uh, than ever. And uh, that's hopefully what, you know, will end up more optimistic than when we started. For some of you, that's probably quite a low base. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it has been a long few weeks. At the moment, I just, I, I don't know, I, I mean, my job is I have to look at the news, don't I? But I just think, oh, just, I don't want to look now. What will happen next? Nuclear Armageddon or something. Um, but no, that's not what we're going to talk about. Um, it's great to be back here in Newcastle. I come here a lot. I was up uh, all Gateshead as well. I don't want to, I know there's rivalry there. I don't want to start some sort of uh, gates at at Newcastle war. We've already got enough problems on our plates. Uh, But it is great for IBB on this cafe to put this on. And it is absolutely critical that, because as you say, this is the only think tank outside of that bubble. Now, I am a traitor to the North. I'm a plastic Northerner. I've abandoned Stockport for London. I should be heckled uh, for that and castigated. If my mum was here, I'm sure she would do that. Uh, But it is critical for me. I spend so much time travelling because I do believe that the... The commentariat, uh, the political world, all the rest is so focused around London, and my goodness, does that show. And for me, even though I have betrayed my northern roots for London, uh, I do, is, for the, one of the reasons that I try and travel as best as possible, uh, is, is selfishly to try and uh, remain as kind of rooted in terms of what people are thinking across the country rather than a subset of people who live in Zone 2 London. And so partly this is me selfishly because we're going to have a discussion and it's me going to, we're going to talk about people's thoughts, priorities, experiences and all the rest and then I'll just steal them. Uh, so that works out well. So thank you. Much appreciated. Um, and thank you for being one of the hottest days of the year as well. You should really be doing something better with your life than listening to me talking. Now, now that point about the bubble uh, that exists in London and the commentariat. Now, I don't say this to blow my own trumpet. Uh, and uh, I say this more as an indictment of the commentary as it exists uh, in London. Uh, because there's a, there a right-wing blogger some of you may be aware of, Guido Fawkes, who normally spends his time uh, laying into me in quite a vicious way. But he, he suggested that I was the only uh, newspaper columnist to predict Brexit. And I do think the reason that happened in terms of the reason I felt it was so inevitable is precisely because I I didn't grow up in London. I grew up in Stockport, and Stockport actually narrowly voted to remain, but that's because the suburbs did. It was Cheshire, so they voted 70 to 75% to stay, where I grew up, voted to leave the European Union, and the people I grew up with, many of them who did vote to leave, I couldn't imagine why they were going to vote uh, to remain. And what we saw just a few weeks ago was very complicated. One is no question that because the gap in terms of class is very, very striking. You saw that in Newcastle, obviously one of the first results that came out. And given how narrow it was, if it was narrow here, it was clear what was going to happen uh, across this country. Because this was seen as being in the bag for a sizable, significant majority for Remain. And that didn't happen. And there was a huge gap between middle class and working class people and how they voted. And the only group in Britain that voted, social groups, sorry, that voted to remain were middle class professionals, working class people. By a lot, we can't generalise in London, working class communities, particularly those mixed communities voted uh, to stay. Same in Manchester. But in many other places outside of the big cities, working class people were most likely uh, to vote to leave. Now, that was partly, there's lots of reasons for that. 
You know, when you had threats of economic crisis and economic insecurity if we left, for people whose lives are defined by economic crisis and economic insecurity, those threats, those blood-curdling threats were not going to work, not least from a Prime Minister who just a few months ago said he was happy for Britain to leave and it would be fine if that happened. But also, um, but also the sense that many working-class people have of a sense of contempt towards them that they are ignored, marginalised, particularly by the sorts of people who live in London. But there was also a failure of people on the left, like myself, who need to take a share of responsibility. Because for many, many years in Britain, the problems that people face have ex almost or overwhelmingly been seen through the prism of immigration. It was notable that the areas with the highest levels of immigration were often the places that were most likely to vote to stay in the European Union, often areas with the lowest levels of immigration voted uh, to leave. Stockport, where I grew up, has very few immigrants, about 4% foreign-born, the biggest single group are Irish. We already had freedom of movement with Ireland before we became members of the European Union. And the biggest group after that were from Pakistan, 0.8%. Again, nothing to do with the European Union. Most immigrants come from outside the European Union. But nonetheless, in Stockport, there are no shortage of problems. A lack of affordable housing, a lack of secure jobs, stagnating or falling living standards, public services under strain. And people saw those problems often through the prism of immigration. An alternative explanation for people simply just wasn't there. The failure of a left which is unable to communicate in a way that resonates with most people. And I, the argument that these are problems to do with the fact we have a country rigged in favour of a tiny elite that puts the interests of the market ahead of the needs and aspirations of most people. That public service is under strain because of cuts. That housing isn't there for people because we have the lowest level of house building in peacetime since the 1920s. That secure jobs aren't there because they've been ripped from our economy, not least by a government that vetoed efforts in the European Union to take on China, trying to wipe out our steel industry with steel dumping. It doesn't matter. These arguments weren't there. They weren't communicated in a way that people understand. And whatever people think about immigration and the concerns and however justified they are, those other explanations simply haven't been there. There was no surprise, or should be no surprise, that in this country, just a few weeks ago, most people voted to leave, in some senses, the surprise could be that the level wasn't even higher. And that is a failure people like me have to take on board. It's a failure of the politics of hope to be communicated in a way that people understand. Now, there is so much anger sweeping the Western world at the moment. Anger that was magnified, it already existed, but magnified by what happened back in 2008, when we were plunged into a crisis by those at the top of society, by the financial sector and their allies in particular. And we have had the best, the majority now, of a lost decade. A lost decade. And across the Western world, the anger is going in one of two directions. And that is a politics broadly based on, on I would say, of hope, of challenging those people at the top, of building a society in the interests of the majority. And the other is the politics of fear, the politics based on blaming your neighbour for all the problems that we all face. Now, those who defend the way things are, who defend injustice, they want us to believe it's like the weather, which is admittedly pretty nice tonight, but it isn't always, no offence to Newcastle, or where I'm from, uh, and, and was expected to believe injustice is like the weather. You can complain about it raining, nothing you can do about it. It's just the way the world is. But the politics of hope obviously believes different, that all injustice is temporary and transient and can be overcome with enough determination, courage and resilience, and that's the history of this country. But all over the Western world, that anger is going in those different directions. On the one hand, it's the likes of Bernie Sanders, that unlikely, you know, septuagint, and whatever you, you know, he's, at, he's not going to be the candidate, but he's had a huge impact in mobilising particularly younger people, this septuagenarian who's become the icon of younger Americans who feel they're disproportionately suffering from the crisis that the United States has suffered from. Uh, whether it be the likes of Podemos in Spain, a party only set up a couple of years ago that's mobilised millions of people, disproportionately younger, 
uh, against the idea they should pay for a crisis they didn't cause. Syriza in Greece, whatever you think about what's happened since and how that government was punished, that's where they came out of. Uh, whether it be, you know, again, whatever people think of the Labour leadership, that's clearly where the Corbyn thing came from, or indeed the Green Surge, or arguably what's happened in Scotland. On the other hand, of course, you've seen the increasingly quasi-fascist clown Donald Trump. And we can ridicule... I mean, he was funny about a year ago, wasn't he? Not quite as funny anymore. Um, and, you know, the sorts of people he's mobilised, the often Americans who are hurting badly because their wages have been stagnating or falling for many, many years. Uh, whether it be the likes of UKIP in this country, a organisation led, or previously led, by that rare breed of... Uh, British politician, a privately educated ex-city broker, uh, funded by multi-millionaire ex-Tory donors with really original policies like privatising the NHS and cutting taxes on rich people, Grr, sticking it to the man. But anyway, in that case, he's mobilised millions of working class people in a way the left has often failed to do uh, because of the huge problems and concerns that millions of people have that they feel are ignored. Uh, the National Front in France, a far-right anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim party, the neo-Nazi Golden Dawn in Greece, in Austria, the far right, which although recently narrowly beaten by the Greens, uh, now there's another election and they are very well placed uh, to take over. Well, he's clapping the Greens, I think, there, but I don't think they're going to keep the presidency, so restrain the clapping for now, but we'll see. Hopefully they will beat them uh, again. Uh, but nonetheless, there's that polarisation that's happening all over the Western world, and that's my fear. You know, it's a mugs game predicting another economic crash, but we haven't recovered from the last one. And if another one happens, the politics of fear is very well placed to exploit people's fear and anger, their justified anger, at the way things are. And that's why we desperately need a politics of hope, because a vacuum has been left. And unless that vacuum is filled, because nature abhors a vacuum, and it will be filled, and it will be filled by the likes of the Nigel Farages or whoever replaces him, Marine Le Pen in France, the Donald Trumps of the world, we have to get our act together, desperately, urgently, and, you know, there's that quote without... I mean, I'm not sure it's a question in terms of stigmatisation, but Albert Einstein was supposed to have said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And often those like myself are guilty of doing so. And much of this talk is self-flagellation. I'm just going to attack myself for my own failure. So I hope you will accept that. Now, now in terms of the problems we face, we could go on, go on for a long time. You know, the longest fall in wages since Queen Victoria sat on the throne, whilst at the same time the richest 1,000 people, their wealth has more than doubled during one of the great economic traumas of our time, where hundreds of thousands of people have been driven into poverty wages, disproportionately women. Whether it be the fact that most people in poverty are in work and they get up in the morning and they earn their poverty day after day after day. Whether it be the fact that unemployment amongst young black men in particular is far higher than it is for most people. It was over half at the peak of this crisis. Whether it be the fact that hundreds of thousands of people, over a million, have been driven to food banks in one of the, on the richest countries that has ever existed. I was going to say the, uh, the, uh, it was the fifth richest economy, but after Brexit, it's now the sixth richest economy uh, because of the fall of the pound. But nonetheless, one of the richest countries that has ever existed and one of the most basic needs people have other than drinking water and breathing to eat in this wealthy country. Some people are denied that right. Hundreds of thousands of them kids. Whether it be a housing crisis where millions of people are deprived of that basic right, that basic need to have an affordable home for them and for their kids. With a lack of council and social housing, this government now shredding what remains, people driven into a private rented sector, not least the next generation as home ownership collapses, not least amongst people under 35. A private rented sector where rents are too high at a time when wages for so many are too low. A lack of security, you can be booted out at such short notice, unable to set down roots. How do you have a family with stability and security if your kids can be bumped from school to school? So I avoid attacking the light while I'm doing it for dra dramatic effects. But, you know, whether it be, you know, I live in London, as I've said, I've already part of my self-flagellation here. Uh, London, where one of the richest booming, this rich booming city, at least for now, where, uh, you know, where you have uh, new build properties that are snapped up by foreign oligarchs. And you can cycle past as I do and all the windows are dark because no one lives there. Whilst at the same time, one in four young people in that city grow up in an overcrowded home. 
And we know the consequences of that, overcrowding, in terms of on health, education, well-being, more likely to suffer from everything from asthma to depression, more likely to do less well at school, and, and all the rest, damaged partly in terms of their potential, often for the rest of their lives. Whether it be that next generation and that promise of the next generation, they would be better off than their parents. Now, when I left sixth form, which is longer than you think, I'm not actually 15, though I might look it, but in 2002, in 2002, not, not an age away, though it does sometimes currently feel that way, but in 2002, the majority of people felt the next generation would be better off than their parents. The polling shows that has flipped dramatically. People now expect the next generation to be worse off than their parents, something that hasn't happened for generations. Whether it be the slashing of the educational maintenance allowance, the trebling of fees for university, for daring to aspire to a, a better education, something from which all society benefits. Whether it be the cutting of youth services often the first to go, the lack of affordable housing that young people disproportionately suffer from, the fallen living standards that have disproportionately affected younger people, whether it be uh, the fact that you can go through university even and end up with the sort of job you'd have got anyway, where you can end up, young people get text messages at six o'clock in the morning telling them if they got any work that day, often to go to get nothing. It's like the return to a bygone era where dock workers marched to the yard and stuck their hands up hoping to get work, often to go home disappointed. No pensions, no paid sick leave, forget paid maternity leave, rights previous workers took as read. Now, we live in a society that is, that is all too often one rule for those at the top and one rule for everybody else. Yeah, so I'm guessing you, know, you all have to pay some tax unless I've horribly misjudged my audience. You're not a multinational corporation, presumably. Um, you're not stashing your fortune somewhere in Panama um, and, and or negotiating your tax situation with our previous chancellor, George Osborne. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, because it is one rule for those at the top and one rule for everybody else. If you're a local coffee shop, a local bookshop, you can't charge yourself for using your own logo and offset it against tax or route your sales to another country with a lower tax regime or, or bring losses from foreign entities onto your balance sheets in this country to make it look like you're not paying any tax, you just have to pay your taxes. And if you get it wrong on your form, you can expect the tax authorities to come knocking on your door pretty pronto. But if you're a multinational corporation like big accountancy firms where they're seconded to the government to help draw up the tax laws, then they tell their clients how to avoid the very laws they themselves have helped to write in the first place. Can you imagine benefit claimants seconded to the Department of Work and Pensions to draw up legislation on social security? We laugh, but benefit fraudsters even. And whenever I make this contrast between benefit fraud and tax avoidance, it's a very obvious glib response. Hang on a minute. Benefit fraud is illegal. Tax avoidance isn't. And therein is the point, because the law often exists to crack down on the misdemeanours of the poor, but to allow or even facilitate the far worse behaviour of those at the top. Whereby, you know, you can commit, you know, get cash in hand and the old bill come knocking on your door if you're unemployed. But if you're a multinational corporation, you can avoid tax on industrial scale and have your own people draw up the tax laws to make sure that is so. Another example where of one rule for those at the top, one rule for everybody else. So, uh, you know, the banks plunged us into economic disaster. They weren't bailed out by free market dogma. They were bailed out by the state. But they became the most lavished benefit claimant in the country. But with two key differences, the amount they got, not a pathetic derisory amount, hundreds of billions, but also so few conditions attached to that support. So they carried on paying more bonuses than every European Union country put together whereby they didn't lend properly to small businesses, ch choking off recovery from a disaster they caused. But compare that to benefit claimants. So I've got an example. Stephen Taylor, 60 years old. He's an army veteran in Manchester. And he was 60 years old, unemployed, tough at that age, if you're unemployed, but he was trying his best. And he was looking for work, desperately. And he was, in the meantime, this army veteran was selling poppies for the Royal Legion for maimed and injured former comrades of his. And he was selling these poppies in a supermarket where he applied for work but was unsuccessful. He had his benefits stopped for four weeks on the basis his volunteering for the Royal Legion showed he wasn't trying hard enough to look for work. Compare and contrast, banks plunged us into economic disaster, all that public money, no questions asked. For those at the bottom, 
their pathetic amount of public money taken away, ever more conditional. Whether you can plunge the country into economic disaster and the state will come rushing to your rescue. Whilst for those at the bottom of society expected to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, even if, to quote Barack Obama, you don't have any boots. Socialism for the rich, capitalism for the poor. Now, we can look at all these injustices and think, how does this continue if they're so obvious and manifest? And there's two big problems. One is resignation. I remember posting about the Panama Papers a few weeks ago. One of the great, I mean, the great injustices of our time. Huge cuts imposed on the basis there isn't enough money, whilst rich people on an industrial scale refuse to pay their taxes, including amongst them politicians imposing cuts. But when I posted making that point, the response wasn't anger. It was, well, duh, what do you expect? Obviously. They would have been more surprised if rich people didn't avoid tax. It was already factored in. It rains on bank holidays, rich people avoid tax. And that frightened me, because it shows that resignation. People accept that injustice as though it's just like the weather. And it's easier to see people in your own community you compare yourself to. You know, I abide by the rules, they don't. And you can see the people you don't think are abiding by the rules. You don't see bankers and tax dodgers as a general principle in your community. You more like to identify people you might think are immigrants or, or unemployed people who you don't think are paying or, or, or who, are, who are benefit fraudsters. The other is the redirecting of anger away from those at the top to people's neighbours down the streets. This term is often bandied around for people who want those at the top to pay a bit more money. The politics of envy. That if you say the richest, richest 1,000 people are, uh, have, uh, you know, they've, they've, they've enjoyed their doubling of their, their fortunes in such a period of economic trauma, maybe they can afford to pay a bit more money. Politics of envy. Because if you stand up for the bottom 70%, they call you a class warrior. You stand up for the top 1%, they call you a moderate. But the reality is, all too often, it's the powerful who promote the politics of envy. Low-paid workers told not to be angry at their bosses for not paying them properly, or the government for cutting their in-work benefits. Instead, envy that unemployed scrounger down the road, living in luxury in a mansion made out of widescreen television sets. Always widescreen television sets. You can't buy any of the form TV anymore, but park that. Private sector workers, pensions decimated. Don't be angry at your boss. Envy the, the nurse, the teacher, the public sector worker. Why should they still have a pension when you don't? People who can't get an affordable home because they're not built. People who can't get secure jobs because they've been ripped from our economy. Don't be angry with the powerful. Envy instead the immigrant getting the job or the home. That should be yours instead. Don't be angry at the fact you're being robbed. Be angry your less deserving neighbour hasn't been robbed quite as much as you have. The politics of divide and rule. Now... All these problems, and we can, this is the problem, the left is very good at talking about this. This is the self-flagellation. The failure, the failure for those on the left like myself, in the face of such injustice, the failure to answer people's problems in a way people understand and inspire them is pretty striking. And it has to change. There was a wake-up call the other week, a dramatic, whatever way you voted, it's a dramatic wake-up call. So here's some of the problems that I'd identify which are critical in terms of building this politics of hope. And, and a lot of it's communication. Because most people do not think in terms of left or right. They think in terms of issues to be addressed in a way that's convincing and coherent, told in a language people understand, that resonates with their experiences. And those who defend the way things are, or want things more run in the interest of the people at the top, or that's the logic of their policies, they never say that themselves, but they often understand this far better. The most commonly Googled phrase in Britain last year during the leaders' debates was, what is austerity? After five years of it. So all people like me talk about austerity, this, austerity, that. And that's not what people, you know, where I grew up in the local pub are talking about austerity as a general principle. It's an abstraction. It doesn't mean anything to most people. And, you know, the, the people, the government for a long time... What they've done is they'll, they'll talk in this language of everyday common sense. The deficit is like a household budget. That's economically illiterate, incidentally. Unless, again, I've misjudged my audience, you've got a central bank in your back garden printing money, which I doubt you have, uh, for example. But nonetheless, that resonates with people. It relates to their everyday lives and experiences. And that is a huge problem, that kind of failure to communicate in a way people understand. And that ha that's what has to be addressed in part. There's a political linguist in the United States called George Lakoff. And he makes the point, the right often talk 
in terms of stories, the left talking facts and statistics. But we're not machines, we're not robots. We don't think in terms of facts and statistics. We think in terms of other human experiences. When I spoke about benefit sanctioning before, I could have said, I don't know what the current level is, but it was certainly one 18-month period, a million people had their benefits sanctioned. But it was far more effective to talk about a six-year-old army veteran, Stephen Taylor, and his experience. It's far more effective than throwing another statistic into it. And that's the thing, you know, to throw another statistic into the, into the ether. Uh, one poll showed that on average people thought 27% of the welfare state was lost to benefit for 27%. That means a lot of people thought it was a lot higher, incidentally, because that's just an average. According to the government, it's 0.7%. That's not because people have been bombarded with figures. They haven't. It's just not true. They are bombarded with lots of stories of benefit fraudsters, though. Extreme examples who are passed off as representative in a way that makes people's blood boil. And then the Daily Mail or the Sun has another example, 50 kids... Lots of widescreen television sets, big house. And people like me go, oh, it's only, but benefit for us only 0.7% doesn't mean anything to people. Of course it doesn't. That language of stories is critical. We've seen it in the refugee crisis. You know, the other week I was in Djibouti in a refugee camp. And it was full of refugees who'd fled Yemen, a country being bombed with British weapons by our good friends and allies, the Saudi Arabian dictatorship. Now, I met these kids... Oh, they were actual 11, 10, 8. I met this little girl, an 11 year old girl, and she'd drawn pictures like little kids do. And the pictures she'd drawn were of planes dropping missiles and people lying in blood. Not pictures you expect little kids to draw. But the reality is, people who fought the corner of refugees, passionate and determined, inspirational even, have often been on a hiding to nothing in this country. But what changed, at least for a moment, it was when that little Kurdish kid was washed up on a beach. Because all of a sudden they were human beings, they were the kids playing football down the road. And humans have a profound capacity for sympathy. Again, to use another statistic against everything I've said, I'm a hypocrite, see, self-flagellation. John Ronson wrote a book called The Psychopath Test, if, I don't know if any of you read it. And he, he claimed about one in every hundred people are sociopaths. How many people are here? No, I'm joking. Um, but most people have a capacity for sympathy. But the problem is, when a group of people have their humanity stripped away from them, then people often will accept or inflict any amount of cruelty upon them. That's our history. And that is a problem that I think people like myself have failed to address, communicating facts, statistics, in a very you know, mechanic, mechanistic, in this, you know, not talking to people in a way that connects with their experiences. And people who, who are up against are far more effective at this, far more effective, infinitely even. Now, here are all the challenges people like me have to face. In the last general election... The Conservatives only had a lead amongst people over the age of 44. That's it. 44 years old. And, part, and we've seen that in the referendum, because incidentally, Leave only had a lead amongst people over 44. Whenever I say this, people over the age of 44 in the room go, you little git, I didn't vote this way. I'm not saying all people did. I'm just saying there's a marked shift. So in this general election, around, sorry, in the referendum, around 70 to 75% of young people voted to remain amongst people over the, over the age of 65, there was an overwhelming majority uh, to leave. No question about that at all. Same in the, in, in the general election. In the general election, uh, something like uh, Labour had a 16-point lead over the Conservatives. And that's not an innate thing. Young people are naive and left-wing and become more right-wing. Because in 1983, Margaret Thatcher had a bigger lead amongst young people, which people often forget. Uh, the same in the United States. The Republicans, Reagan, Bush, had big leads amongst young people. So this phenomenon of young people shifting is actually quite a new phenomenon in terms of an overall picture. Uh, because people often look at the 1960s but forget the sorts of people protesting were a very small section of young people overall. But in any case, um, and, uh, but, so there's obviously an issue of inspiring young people. I want to talk partly about that because that's one of the central thrusts that I want to talk about. To vote. Actually... There was a, there was, it was suggested originally that turnout amongst young people in the referendum was very low, but actually it was far higher than people actually initially suggested. Most young people came out to vote, in actual fact. Not enough, still less than older people, but far more actually than the general election. But nonetheless, young people often see politics as irrelevant, divorce from their everyday lives and experiences. It's full of people who aren't very sympathetic in their own opinion. Politics occasionally comes into their lives to attack them, cuts the local youth service, trebles their tuition fees, and that's kind of your lot. 
but so he needs a new, and that's what I want to uh, get. I'll, I'll develop that further. But so we obviously need to inspire more young people. But we've got to talk about older people. We live in an aging society, thanks to improvements in public health and all the rest. It's a good thing. And um, amongst older people, conservatives have increased their lead with every single election since 1997. Unless people like myself appeal to older people, then we are finished. We're toast. We'll never win another election. We'll never change anything. And that means talking about issues like pension of poverty, which is still amongst the highest uh, in, the, in comparable Western worlds, despite improvements in the last 15 years, the terrible lack of social care in this country. People work all their lives and they end up with terrible care. We need a new social care system fit for the future. Issues like loneliness amongst lots of older people in this country. These are all issues we have to talk more about. It's an existential threat to our existence. Here's another point in terms of how society is changing. It's projected that self-employed people, there'll be more self-employed people than public sector workers in the next two or three years. Now, lots of self-employed people, they like their independence, not least in a country where bosses have so much power. You know, that idea of being free and all the rest is very appealing to people. But people often don't like the insecurity. The newly self-employed, their wages are much lower. They often struggle to get secure work. Uh, they can't get loans from banks often. They often can't get mortgages. They lack things like paid sick leave, paid maternity leave. They're used often for that purpose because they're cheaper. Uh, so an attempt to drive down wages. They've got poor infrastructure, little things like how bad Wi-Fi is in this country. If you're a self-employed person on the move, you run your business on a, on a computer. It's very difficult to do. Uh, chasing invoices all the time uh, and often struggling to get them paid. These are huge issues we have to start talking about. It's an existential threat. Again, we've got to look at how society is changing and evolving. Another point, you know, and I don't often quote Ronald Reagan, obviously, uh, but Ronald Reagan, he was very clever, and this is what the right often are very clever at doing, because, yeah, obviously his policies, in effect, what they ended up doing is shoveling wealth and power into the hands of very small groups of people, and workers in America have suffered flatlining or falling wages for a long time, and people like Donald Trump are feeding on that, but he always talked in terms of optimism. Morning in America, that was his big catchphrase, and often the left since have been very defensive, miserable. Stop this, stop that, stop the cut, stop prioritisation, stop the world I want to get off. Rather than an optimistic vision of the sort of society we could build together, a society running the interests of the majority. And often we've got this depressing, defensive view of the world. And we've got to learn from our opponents in that way. And that means going on the offensive with ideas. You know, now one of the only things that's good that's happened the last few year, uh, few sorry weeks... One of the only things that happened in the last few weeks of, that's positive, if the government's entire economic strategy has collapsed completely, that long-term economic plan, do you remember that? What an epitaph George Osborne will have politically. But anyway, uh, they failed calamitously. They failed on all their targets and all the rest. And then people like Stephen Crabb, the former Conservative candidate for leader, he's calling for a £100 billion investment plan in our economy. And other Conservatives are coming out and make, calling Sajid Javid, for example, he was supposedly out on the libertarian right, calling for a fiscal stimulus that would increase the deficit from 5 to 7% of our economy. There's a massive opening there. We can talk now openly about investing in our economy with public investment banks to support the industries of the future. Learning from countries like Germany, where they haven't had the, the dogma of let the market decide. We don't pick winners or losers. Let the market do. If industries die, so be it. That's just the way it is. They actually in, in, had a, an active industrial policy. They created hundreds of thousands of jobs in renewable energy, taking on the environmental but also the jobs crisis, giving young people good, dignified, secure, decent work backed up with apprenticeships. These are the sorts of things we desperately need uh, to be talking about. Finally, there's an opening there that wasn't actually there even a few weeks ago. It wasn't easy to exploit. Now, that point I want to talk about particularly, because this is what I'm going to throw everything in. Look, I speak at so many meetings and rallies and protests. I spent the last few years doing often very little else. And it is important, it's very important. It's important to speak particularly, including to people who already agree with probably a lot of what I'm saying. It has its role because we've got to mobilize people. Because lots of those people across the country feel kind of resigned themselves. What do they do about things? But it, it alone isn't enough and what I've learned and what I want to partly talk about is it, and you, what, what I want to focus on, particularly in the next few months, is, I don't know what we're going to call it, Project Hope or something like that. 
I work with this charity in Manchester called Reclaim. And what they do is they give leadership training to young working class people. They're so inspirational. And there's another project I work with called the Boys Project that works with young working class men. Now, these are people who don't turn up to meetings like this or protests or rallies. But they're not apathetic. You know, this idea of young people being apathetic, they're resigned often. And the way politics, we talk about it, including people like me on the left, is so divorced from their everyday lives. And what we're doing then is to hopefully bring together this broad new initiative which will focus on organising in those communities with young working class people given the confidence and skills uh, to actually be able to lead these sorts of movements of the future. Because these are the voices we're not hearing at the moment. And this is absolutely critical. Absolutely critical for what happens in the months ahead. Because young people, particularly working class young people, have suffered the brunt of what's happened in the last few years, but they haven't been heard or listened to. And unless we can mobilise those people, this country has no future. So for me, this is absolutely critical. People like me have to go far more outside our comfort zones and far more working with those young community organisations, the young grassroots, if you like, who aren't coming and turning up to initiatives like this. So this is something very much in the pipeline. We have our first meeting on Wednesday, but it's absolutely critical for a politics of hope that can resonate with people outside of those who already agree in, sort, in large part with what people like me are talking about. And here's one other thing I want to mention, because it does come up a lot. When uh, Jeremy Corbyn became leader of the Labour Party, the Conservatives responded in a very restrained way. They said Labour was now a threat to national security, economic security, and the security of your kids. Now, we laugh here, people laughed on social media. It works out there, often. It's poison. It really does work. And a few own goals added into that, and it reinforces those impressions. And if people think that about us, we've lost so badly, not least in working-class communities... And that is something which the referendum should wake people up to. But we can turn that on its head, because people think, particularly in England, if you talk about patriotism, it means being chauvinistic. It's a back to the empire, it's racism and all the rest. And it has been monopolised all too often by those reactionary movements. But we can say, what is more patriotic about wanting to rid your country of injustice? What's more patriotic about defending the rights and freedoms our ancestors fought for at such cost? What's more patriotic than defending proud achievements of this country like the welfare state, the NHS, the BBC, all of which are now under attack? What's more patriotic about building a society running the interests of the majority rather than a tiny elite? And what is patriotic about forcing the majority to pay for a crisis they didn't cause? What is patriotic about undermining the rights and freedoms that our ancestors fought for at such cost? What's patriotic about building a society rigged in favour of those at the top while well, hundreds of thousands of people in this country are unable to feed themselves, whilst it remains boom time for those at the top. We can turn these arguments on their head, and it's critical we do so. And just to wrap up on that, because these are difficult times, and it's pointless to pretend otherwise. But my word, we've had some difficult times in this country in the past, and the odds we face are far less insurmountable than the odds our ancestors faced as they fought at such cost for, our for, for the rights and freedoms we have. You know, change isn't given as a gift by the powerful. They didn't wake up one day and think, oh, I'm feeling generous, I'll give women the vote for a laugh. People had to fight for these things at great cost and great sacrifice. Whether it be the early trade unionists who fought for the rights and dignity of working people, whether it be the Chartists in the 19th century in places like this who fought for democracy for working men, whether it be the suffragettes, everyone loves the suffragettes now, they're films made out of them, but they were hated, hated in their time. They were terrorists and anarchists. They were dragged off the streets by police officers and thrown into prison cells with tubes forced down their noses. Whether it be those who fought for the welfare state and the NHS in the teeth of what seemed like overwhelming opposition from the powerful, whether it be those who fought racism, sexism, homophobia, battened in the streets, spat at. But we stand on the shoulders of giants. Everything we have was fought for and won at great cost and great sacrifice by, no doubt, some people in this room, by your mothers, your fathers, your grandmothers, your grandfathers and your ancestors before them. And we owe it to our ancestors, particularly at times like this, to defend all the rights and freedoms they won at such cost and to continue fighting in their name for a different sort of society run in the interests of the majority. And I, I bring these people up, not just out of kind of nostalgia and to be all dewy-eyed, 
even though it is the right thing to do to remember the people who fought for all the things we have at such cost because it was so hard and so lonely. But it is a reminder of how difficult change can be. That history is not victory, success, victory, success. It's often defeat, setback, defeat, setback, and then victory. And it was so lonely and hard for those people. These were people who were hated, marginalised, ignored, worse, persecuted, tortured, murdered. But they won in the end. And it reminds us that change is not easy. But it is possible if we have the same determination and courage and resilience of our ancestors. That we're not just defensive all the time. That we learn to communicate in a way that people understand. And all of this is me self-flagellating. I'm not here to offer all the answers. That's partly what events like this are all about. But I am absolutely convinced that a politics of hope is entirely possible, even in the darkest of times like this, because we have had far darker times in Britain and in Europe, and we have still won. So please, let's have the same determination, let's have the same courage, and let's have the same resilience our ancestors showed. Because we cannot just, we won't just defend the rights and freedoms they, we, they won at such cost. We will build a society run in the interests of the majority but we do have to have the same determination and courage and resilience that they showed. Thank you. Cafe Culture North East is supported by Newcastle University, Peels and Dance City. We're also supported by DC Cafe, who host the events.